I'm on, Dan. Is it working? I'm on. I should be on. I'm on. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. Is that working? All right. Welcome. I'm not, I'm not hosting, but we're trying out a mic, so it's very exciting. And so uh, Craig is now hosting, so welcome to Life Church. Thanks, Craig. There we go. I've never seen Dell in a flap. That's amazing, <laughs> mate. I love that. So welcome, everyone, to Life Church. Sorry, just so not good enough. Right, we'll try that again. Welcome everyone to Life Church. Mar marginally better. Okay, so if you're new with us here this morning, or perhaps your family or friends of Dell and Lindsay and you at the wedding yesterday, a really warm and special welcome to you. It's great to have you with us, and we're excited about having you with us. We've got some um, cakes left over from yesterday at the back. And I'm told cake is like curry. Always tastes better the second day when it's gone uh, over the back. I, I don't buy it, but anyway, it's for you to test at the back, so it'll all be good. Okay, so a few notices for you this morning. Please put your hands up if you attend a Life Church Life group. Okay, that's not bad. That's not bad. Very good. Okay, so if you don't attend a Life group, I just want to encourage you to attend one. It's great to be able to walk out our Christian journey together, and we have a few life groups. So, on a Tuesday at 5 o'clock, um, Del and Beth and Lindsay run a young adults group. That's at 5 o'clock. And then at 7.30, Del runs a men's only group. Um, yeah, all in Howley, uh, all at the Dellers. Got to get this right now. At the Dellers home, yeah. So... Oh, okay, change of plan. The men's is at Callum's in Latchford. So if you want to join either a young adults or a men's only group, come and see uh, Dell after, and he'll point you in the right direction. Um, and also on a Tuesday night in Stockton Heath, uh, Richard, Fiona, and Gemma and Rob run a life group uh, there as well. That's Stockton Heath, so if you uh, are that side of town, please come and speak to Gemma. Um, and uh, she'll point you in the right direction there. And on a Thursday, uh, myself and Caroline run a group, and that is, um, yeah, that is in our home, Petri Farm, which is basically Walton Locks, which is up on the way to Walton. So if you live that side of town and you're interested in coming to Life Group, please come and speak to me. That would be fantastic. Okay, good. Uh, other notices, just to let you guys know that we are, uh, we're going to be running a lunch after church, uh, two times a term. So what will happen is, uh, we haven't got an exact date yet, we're still sort of like finalizing it, but in the next sort of four weeks, on one of the Sundays, we'll have a lunch after the service. Uh, and we just ask that you bring, you know, whatever you want to bring, um, savory, sweet, or if you can't bring anything, that's also fine, we just want you to come along. And we're just gonna have an hour and a half together, sharing lunch, having a bit of family time together, we think that's a good thing to do. Uh, it's a new thing we're going to do, and uh, so just watch this space on that, uh, and that's going to be something to look forward to. Okay, band, where are you? Hopefully we've got a band. As he stood up, I'm not sure he's quite up to running the whole thing yet, but he might be. Okay. Just while band gets sorted, I just wanted to read you a couple of scriptures. We were talking this morning about how Jesus is going to build his church, and uh, not despite his disciples, but through his disciples. That means us, okay? And uh, we were talking about and praying about the importance of the Holy Spirit living in us. And uh, I'm just going to read this scripture from Romans, Romans 8. And it says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can I get a yes, amen for that? I'll say it again. Let's get some excitement in this this morning, yeah? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Okay, we're going to warm up, guys, okay? For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man 
to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Well done, Tom. Amazing. Amazing. And it goes on to say this. It goes on to say this. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature. For in you, living according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And finally, it says this. And this, I think this is amazing. It's something to get excited about, church, this morning. It says this. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. How amazing is that? So that's who we are, guys. That's our identity as sons and daughters of God, co-heirs and heirs with Christ. That's what we're praising this morning. That's what we can stand confidently this morning in who we are and offer our praise to Jesus and our Father God. Holy Spirit is here. He is here. And we're going to have a great time this morning. So if you can be on your feet, that would be amazing if you can stand. And uh, Andy and the band are going to lead us this morning. So over to you guys.
rescuer. And then we have to shout like we mean it. All ready? He's our rescuer. Hey, he's our rescuer. Joseph took the song. There's a lot going on at the moment in everyone's lives. And um, we've, we have discussed before this song is a particular anthem against a lot of the things that we're facing, these kind of particular giants that are in our lives. And those can look like different things. They can be giants of debt. They can be giants of worry. They can be giants of fear. Uh, they can be physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is. But we've probably all got something at the moment that we're thinking about, even whilst we're in church and our minds getting distracted. So I just want to just call that out, whatever that is, whether it's us or someone else in our family just going to raise a hallelujah this morning and whatever that thing that's standing in in front of us if you're thinking about being a Christian it's yeah it's going to rain and and it's going to shine in our lives but um it's about saying God is good whatever the situation I know that's really hard um but I I believe that's where we have freedom when we can do that when we can just say despite my circumstances despite what I'm in despite what's there God is good God is faithful God is just God is true it's all of those things that the Bible says he is um, so I want to sing that and um, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll praise I will pray out this morning
guys. You can just take a seat for a second. Um, just wanted to move into a little bit of time of um, of sharing. You know, you know when we sang that song about being fearless. Uh, I was reminded about the fact that we defeat the enemy by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb by Jesus and what He did for us on the cross, but also by the power of our testimonies. It's two things, right? And I think Andy's right. There is a lot going on in our community at the minute. And people, you know, certain people have got their challenges. But we've got to stand and take position against the enemy. And we've got to basically share the good things that God's doing. Because that speaks to our spirit. That draws out the encouragement that God has for us. And uh, so we're just going to move. We're going to continue to worship in a minute and sing. But I just felt prompted just to like let's have a moment of just sharing and building each other up in the family um, and I think Catherine's going to come and, and share something to start us off good morning um, I hope I'm, I'll be able to say the a message that will, as God uh, gave it to me while I was um, yesterday I got up in the morning and I was just singing a, lang a, sh um, a song in my language, which is uh, Psalms 23. And I, I kept singing and singing Psalms 23. And then, and then I looked at these words, you prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> Who does that? Because we know where there's an enemy, there's attack, there's chaos, there's everything. But our God... He prepares a table before our enemies. I don't know what David was going through at, at this moment in time when he wrote this psalm, but something was definitely going on. But he chose to say, Lord, you prepare a table before me. You, you prepare, sorry. <laughs> he chose to say, you prepare a table before, before me in the presence of my enemies. And he didn't just stop there. He said, you anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. So in the Bible, oil simplifies as the Holy Spirit. So the word I have for you is whatever you're going through, God set you at that table. And as he set you at that table, he's continuing to pour out his spirit as you sit there. David, as we all know, he, he went on to become a great king. <laughs> But when he was writing this, we don't know what he was going through. So whatever you are going through today, this is an encouragement. As long as you continue to sit in his presence, he will continue pouring his Holy Spirit. And another day, you will be like David, who became a great king of, a great king of Israel, even though he went through a lot of difficulties and trouble. So it's just to encourage you whatever you are going through. Keep sitting at the table. Continue to let his Holy Spirit continue to outpour, outpour, and outpour. It says, my cup overflows. So let your, let your Spirit, con let Holy Spirit continue flowing and flowing, and he will see you through whatever you are going through today. Thank you. Thank you, Kath. That's great. Can um, Eric and Caroline just stand up at the back? Just turn around and just familiarize yourself with Eric and Caroline. Thanks, guys. You can sit down. I, I just want to share something, um, a little story that they shared with me recently. They went to Great Yarmouth on holiday. And uh, when they came back, I asked the usual questions because I'm a pastor that cares for people, right? Yeah. So I said, how was your holiday? And they said, yeah, it was good. It was good. And I was expecting them to talk about all the lovely days they'd had, you know, uh, exploring Great Yarmouth and around there. And they said, Craig, there were so many homeless people. So many homeless people. And uh, I said, all right, okay. So uh, I said, you know, wh wh what happened? And they said, well, we didn't give them any money because um, we didn't feel that that was what God called us to do. But every morning we went out and uh, we went to them and we explained that we were Christians and uh, we, we, we asked if we could pray for them. How amazing is that? You know, we talk about having courage in our church 
and church being outside of these four walls, yeah? And there's two of our congregation on holiday, just, Lord, what have you got for me for today? Right, I want you to go and spend some time speaking to these guys and praying them and, and blessing them. And I think that's amazing. I think that's what we should be like, yeah? It should be, we should have a heart for everyone, um, and especially those that have, you know, not had a, a good run and, you know, are, are, are feeling marginalized or just need, need, need someone to know that they're cared for and someone's got a hope and a purpose for them. So how good's that? I was really encouraged by that. It's amazing, isn't it? So uh, let's, let's give them a, a round of applause for that. That's good. Okay. Has anyone else got anything they'd like to share? Anything? I, I, I can't believe God... Oh, you can always rely on Pete. Right. Okay. Pete, you, we, we want to get home for tea, mate. All right. right what I was going to say is I think... Just keep Craig here. I think... I was thinking we, we need to do a whip round for our pastor because he looks like a decorator nearly every <laughs> Sunday with these jeans on. They're probably highly fashionable, but, you know, we just need to pray for this man. <laughs> that wasn't what I was going to say, by the way. I was just, but, yeah, similar thing to what, you know, what Eric and Caroline there, we were on holiday recently in um, Somerset, and as we were in Cheddar Gorge, never been there before, beautiful part of the country. And um, I was walking down the street, and... You know me, as Craig just introduced me, I'll speak to anybody, you know, and I'll tell them about the Lord whenever I feel that unction to tell them. And there was this guy, and, and it, I was just walking down, he worked for the organization, he was a bit like the National Trust type guy, but he, he did it for Cheddar Gorge. And I just hit it off with him, just having this chat, and I just felt this unction in my spirit to share it, like the story of our Josh, who got miraculously healed by a tumor about 12 months ago. And I just had it there, and I went, listen, mate, I said, can you just show you a photo of something? And I took the photo out and I showed him it. And I showed him the before and after and told him a big, brief five-minute story of what happened. I was like, mate, I just can't believe you're talking to me about this. He said, I had the exact same problem of two years ago. He said, but I had to have surgery and I had to have it removed. And it was all, I'm okay now. But he said, it was just a real hard time in my life. And he said, it's just a bit strange you talk to me about the exact same surgical issue that I had. And then I just moved into the gospel and just started telling him about Jesus and how much he loved him and how much he wants the personal relationship. He classed himself as a Christian. But as we know, going to church doesn't make us a Christian in the same way, you know. Sitting in McDonald's doesn't make us a Big Mac or sitting in a garage doesn't make us a car, does it? Sitting here today does not make us a Christian. Having a personal relationship and a heart that's warmed and turned to God for a the amazing, miraculous salvation that has taken place, that powerful gospel that has changed. And I got the opportunity to share this with this guy. And he said to me, he said, I've been in and out of church for many years, he said, but no one's ever shared it the way you're telling me. And I'm not saying I was a good communicator, but I believe there was something of the Spirit of God in what I was saying that was touching his heart. And as I spoke to him, it, his eyes were a little bit glazed over. And I said, his, his colleague came up, so he all of a sudden became awkward because I really wanted to lead this guy to Christ. Because he didn't have a personal relationship. He knew about God, but he didn't know God. You know what I mean? And it's so often we in church can know a lot about God. And we can, we can look the part, but actually our life has fallen apart inside, isn't it? Church. But Jesus is the one that makes the difference. And he's the only one who can fill that void and fill that hole. And I managed to chat with this guy. And this guy sat awkwardly to the side while me and John were talking. And I just said, John, where's your quiet place in your house, mate? And he went... I don't really have one, mate. It's when I go on my walks, which I'll be doing tonight with my dog. I said, well, when you go out, mate, everything I've just told you about, about the gospel, about a personal relationship, how you can't earn your salvation, it's a free gift. I said, just talk to your Father in heaven. Have that conversation and ask him to come into, that, come into your life and fill that void that's there. I said, because you're trying to fill it with so many things, but nothing can ever satisfy it like God. I said, having that personal relationship with Jesus. And he said, I'm going to do it tonight, mate. I really feel what you're saying is just being at a God moment. So what I'd encourage you, churches, is that let's take those opportunities. Let's just reach out to our communities. Let's reach out to our friends and families. When you realize you can't save a single person, the pressure's off. All you have to do is communicate something of the love of God. And someone's heart can just be ignited. The Holy Spirit can just uh, make someone alive and, and renew them and, and just come into their life and fill them. And let's face it, guys, we're here today because somebody told us we didn't just walk in by mistake. So I just encourage you, church, we have some good news. Let's be sharing that mm -hmm. at any opportunity. And Craig still needs a pair of pants. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pete. So... 
what Catherine shared, what, what Eric and, and, and Caroline did, and, and what Pete shared there, there was one thing connecting those three testimonies, those three things, and it was this. In each of those cases, it was spirit-prompted. And we want to be a, a church that lives life through the spirit. So, as Pete encouraged you, I want to encourage you as well, is take time out to spend with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He wants, to, he wants a relationship with you. Yeah? So, really, we want to be active in what the Spirit is asking us to do and calling us to do. And it's really great to... We're going to do this often. We're going to share what God's doing in our community and the good things he's doing often because, as I say, it's that that defeats the enemy as, as well as the blood of Jesus Christ. So, yeah, it's worth celebrating, right, church? Good stuff. Okay. Sorry, Andy, I took a bit of your time up there, mate, but it's good stuff, right? I'm back to Andy. Can we get on our feet again? Is that okay?
just take a seat for a minute. Thank you, band. That was amazing. Annette, where's Annette? There she is. Come up here, Annette. Annette's like, what's he doing here? He didn't mention anything to me. What's he doing getting me up here? I can see it all up. <laughs> and where's Callum? Callum is here. Has he gone to crash? Can we get him? Let's get him. So it's this time of year when um, a lot of our young adults are off to university. And some of them have gone. Some of them are going. And um, Callum, is, uh, he's not going to university, but he's got a new job. And uh, it means that it's a, it's a great job, but it means he has to work on a Sunday morning. So he's going... Um, traitor. He's go leaving Latchford to go to Lim. Now, I don't know how I feel about this. Heartstrings are tugged, but yeah, you're right, Ali. It is. It's, it's what do you mean, no? Do you all feel sorry for him? Uh, no. So, he is, so I thought it'd be great, because he has served Latchford for so many, so many Sundays uh, in all kinds of ways, particularly on sound and with all that happens through that, and I just thought it'd be good. Here he is. Just to thank him. Give him a round of applause as he comes forward. Come on, Callum. Uh, mate, I so didn't want to do this, but Holy Spirit told me I had to, so here we go. So, um, mate, it's, um, you've got a new job. Uh, yeah, I'm the head chef at the Hayloft now, so I have to work Sunday mornings, but I'm going to move to Lynn. Yeah, I told you, a traitor. So, uh, now, so what we're going to do, Annette, can you just, uh, we're going to reach out and pray for Callum. Starting any new job, it's, it's a bit nerve wracking, isn't it? And, you know, there's new challenges in all of that. So, uh, I'm going to ask Annette to pray for Callum, but also to pray for uh, all our young adults who are starting afresh in university and colleges and all that. So, uh, Annette, do you mind doing that on the spot? I know, but it's all good. Yeah. Yeah, Father God, I thank you for um, open doors of opportunity, open doors of new opportunity that you place before us. And Lord, I thank you for this open door of new opportunity that you've placed before Callum. And uh, yeah, we're sad to see him go to Lynn, but he's only going down the road and he's still in your kingdom and he's still, um, he's still linked with you and very much uh, belonging to you. And everything that he does is for you and for your glory. So, Lord, um, that's what we pray over him right now, that as he steps out and steps into this new job and steps into um, this new church, uh, new, new for him, Lord, that you would just make very clear what it is that he is to do. Um, Lord, I pray in the new job that there would be God connections for him, um, that there would be real times of opportunity like we've spoke about this morning, uh, like Pete spoke about, like Caroline and Eric had, uh, Lord, where he can really minister into the lives of others and that he would quickly find his place in the new church. And Lord, I pray for everyone that's going off to university um, this morning, Father God, I pray that um, they would shine as lights for you. It can be quite a dark place. It can be quite a difficult place. So Lord, I pray that you would shine your light through them. And uh, again, that they would quickly find their feet and that, that we're, they would find their spiritual home wherever it is that they're going in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Callum. Thank you for all you've done, mate. And uh, let's give him another round of applause. That's great. Okay. So kids, Three to sixes, seven to tens, any crash. There's facilities for, for those that have got young babies. That's great. Del, you can relax for a second. Yeah. yeah. You can get set up, mate. You can get set up. But one of the things that we, um, we want to do as part of, of Light Church Latchford is, is um, focus on a Sunday morning just for a few minutes on the nations. There's a lot going on, and uh, we're going to have each Sunday, we're going to be praying just a few minutes for, for the nations, and, and we're going to be basically looking outwards to what the needs are, what we want to pray for, you know, what revival we want to see, what, what, what things need breaking, and it, we sung earlier, didn't we, about Jesus breaking every chain, and we believe that. So uh, I'm going to invite Godwin up. Godwin is... Uh, He's a good man of God, is Godwin.
just the name says it all really, doesn't it? God win. I mean, what more do you want, right? So <laughs> it's, um, we're going to start. We, we, we talked about it, didn't we, Godwin? We talked about it yesterday and said, right, what, of all the nations, which nation is the most in trouble, yeah? So we're going to start praying for the UK this morning. Uh, yeah, I'm not even going to mention anything to do with that word. But anyway, we're, uh, Godwin's going to take us to that. And then next week, we're going to concentrate on the nations of Africa. And we're going to just work through the nations, praying for them. And it's going to be so, so part of our service, something we're going to do because we feel called to do it. And it's good to be outward looking. So, Godwin, I'm going to hand over to you, mate. Is that all right? Good morning, everybody. It's a privilege to pray for the nation. Um, uh, we've been, uh, we are a community church. And this is the time I felt that we wanted to give something back to the community. I know our church uh, gives more than 50% of what we do to the community. That's financially. But spiritually, we have been enjoying the goodness of uh, God in church. And we want to do something uh, to the community spiritually by praying for the nation. So um, as we read in Ezekiel 22.30, uh, God says, I look for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. Isn't it uh, a sad thing that it's, it, it, uh, God opens his heart looking at everybody, s looking for s one who can stand in the gap and he couldn't find one. I don't want uh, to be one of those who God termed, and I want to be one among those one. Uh, how, how many of you would like to be the, the one whom God is looking for? I, I believe everybody in this church has a burden for uh, the nation. Uh, that's why we do church every Sunday. Otherwise, we would have uh, various other means to spend this two hours of time uh, that other people, uh, people do. But for us, this one and a half hours is a great moment in our life every Sunday, which we would never uh, can afford to lose. Amen. So, yeah. So, um, uh, in this verse, according to this verse, um, God, uh, God was God searching for a prophet or a pastor or uh, some designated personality? No, he called. He was looking for a man. So. Uh, he's looking for a, an ordinary man who has a heart for the nation. So we, as a church, we are, we should be praying for the nation. So that's what this verse uh, clearly says. Um, so when when um, when Abraham he heard uh, the the angels talking that God is going to uh, destroy Sodom, immediately what he did. Uh, the verse says in Genesis 18, 20 to 22, if you read, um, uh, verse 21, I believe, it says, Abraham stood in the gap, um, sorry, when the sins of Sodom was grievous and the outcry reached God, verse 10 22, it says, but Abraham rem remained standing before the Lord. So how many of you are prepared? So I, I want to encourage every one of you, to prepare and stand for, uh, stand before the Lord um, to close the gap for our nation. Um, uh, we, I, I, I'm a foreigner, um, but I enjoy the goodness of this country, and I'm blessed, and so so are you. So every one of us are blessed uh, by the goodness. So it, I feel that it is high time that we have to pray as church together Every Sunday, we will be praying for our nation, and we'll pray for another country. Um, I, I, I was just thinking that we'll go uh, in alphabetical order, starting from the first country, Craig said, uh, Africa. Uh, but I, uh, I think Afghanistan comes before that. So we'll, we'll start uh, to pray for each country. So now, um, shall we all stand to our feet, and then we'll... Um, yeah. Second Chronicles seven fourteen says, "If my people who are called by my name, that's us, Amen, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's not us. 
here it terms everybody, so that I will hear from heaven and, and will forgive their sin and heal the land. Uh, somebody said this, if you want to pray, if you want to stand in the gap, you have to um, feel the sins. So we have to feel our country, our people are, have sinned, and it is my sin as well. So I have to ask forgiveness on behalf of them so that God will not destroy them. And I go in um, one verse, it says, um, it is God is not willing to lose any of these little ones. Matthew 18, 14 says, God doesn't want anybody to be lost. And one soul that has been saved from being perished, because of that soul, the heaven rejoices. So, and also God says that whatever you want uh, to happen, do uh, do to your neighbor as you want uh, wanted to be done, wanted it to be done to yourselves. So, um, do, uh, do we, would anybody want uh, think of going to hell? No, definitely not. If we don't want to go to hell, then definitely we don't want our neighbors our uh, people of our country, our MPs, our Prime Minister, Queen, uh, all all people around us, we, we don't want them to go to heaven. Let's all close our eyes and pray. Thank you, Lord. Um, we are not going to pray for a specific point, but we'll give our nation in God's hands and pray for all, whatever comes in your mind, you can, you're free to pray, uh, you, you, can, you can pray for it. Whatever you think is not a, according to the word of God that is happening in this country, you can pray uh, for it. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful nation, Lord. Lord, thank you for the missionaries who went, uh, uh, who crossed the seas and went to the nations. Ends of end of the world, they went and shared gospel. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all that, uh, all the goodness you have kept in this, uh, um, in this land, O oh Lord. Thank you for the prosperity. Thank you for the wealth. Thank you for all the nature, good, lovely greenery you have given in this country, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the agriculture. Thank you for everything that you have given to our country, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But Lord, we want you more in this land, O oh Lord. We want more of you, O oh Lord. We want more of you, Lord. Your hand is not too short, Lord. Lord, your hand is extended. You always are waiting with op arms open wide for a lost son, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we give uh, all our MPs, O oh Lord. We give all the ruling party, every member of the ruling party, every member of the opposition party, O oh Lord. We give them in thy hands, O oh Lord. We pray for the queen and her entire family, O oh Lord. Lord, bless them. Bless each and every one of the member of parliament. Bless each and every one of the, uh, every counselor, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We pray for the businessmen in this country, O oh Lord. Lord, let their business flourish, O oh Lord. Lord, at this moment, Lord, the whole nation is thinking of something, but Lord, we know you have a way, f in, way out in everything, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We sprinkle the blood of Jesus in the whole of United Kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. In the whole of United Kim Kingdom, we sprinkle your blood. Hallelujah. Lord, you created us in your own image, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Like you created me, Lord, you created every other, uh, uh, my neighbor as well, O oh Lord. Lord, you, you created them so that you will you uh, you will you want uh, you wanted them to come back to heaven, Lord. Lord, we don't want them to be perished, O oh Lord. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If people of God, you you have given up on something that th there's there's nothing that can save this land. Uh, I wanted to encourage you that there are always seven thousand prof uh, people who do not bow their heads before Baal. So there are people who are praying for this country, and there are people who are still working on the revival. 
with the with the spirit of god so never give up god is there and wherever um, even uh, wherever air cannot penetrate the prayer can penetrate our prayers from this place will make a change hallelujah thank you jesus thank you lord thank you hallelujah 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 thank you jesus thank you for this wonderful moment oh lord lord you bless the nation in jesus name i pray amen thank you guys okay so was that good it's good right it's we need more of god and we need more of god in our nation don't we so <coughs> talking about more of god Dal's going to come up and share what's on God's heart with us. Let's just reach out and let's just pray quickly for Dal. Father God, we thank you for this man that you love and are working through him and all that you do through him, Father God. And we just pray that as he brings your word this morning, that there's a, a closeness between his heart and your heart. That Holy Spirit, you will just hover over Dal as he brings these words and I just pray that for all of us that we just prepare our own hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. Let it challenge us, let it mold us, let it change us, let it, let it send us into this week with something that is of you and uh, yeah, Lord, give us courage and thank you for all that you have for us this morning. Amen. I'm going to go with this one. I should be on. Uh, I'm on. Yeah, that sounds all right. Um, when it whistles massively, I'll switch. Uh, no, it won't whistle massively, Dan, because you're all over it. And that is a lack of confidence that I have in you there. And so we'll all be fine. Right. So, yeah, so we are in our Acts series. Those of you who've, not, who've been here for a few weeks will know we're in the third week of Acts. I don't know. I go out with you sometimes, so I lose track. I think we're in a third. We're in Acts. Let's, just, let's not worry about counting. We're in Acts. That's a safe statement right there. And so it's my job to preach on my favourite character in the entire Bible. Um, it's one of them things that when, the more you preach, the more you go, oh, this is one of my favourite verses, this is one of my favourite stories. And before you know it, you're saying it a lot. But this guy is my favourite guy. You know, like, he is there. And so I've just come back from honeymoon in America and people ask, oh, what was your favourite part of honeymoon? What was the favourite kind of thing, what did you do, and, and I kind of think about a day where we went into California, and Lindsay was driving a Mustang, which, and we were driving on the California coast road, and more importantly to me, we went and got pie, then we went and got ice cream, and so, you know, it's a big day, yeah, it's a big day. When we were planning, I was looking at the itinerary, I was literally like, we're going there with the sole purpose of buying pie and ice cream, like, that was the whole point of the day, and so, like, it was a nice drive in that, but pie and ice cream happened. Then we went to baseball, which is a giant snacking world with a, with a random, very boring sport in the background, and so, like, I loved it, it was the greatest time. I just sat there jumping. I had a corn dog, which is weird. It's like a hot dog deep fried. And so like they deep fry Rice Krispie treats. It's not acceptable. Uh, but it was, Lindsay had some chips, which she got some garlic fries, which she thought might have some garlic salt on it. And it was literally like maybe two jars of garlic and some chips. It was horrific. And I, I was sat there knowing that I'd won the food order that day. It's not about winning or losing, as we'll see, but sometimes you just win. And so, um, <laughs> So, but Barnabas, he's genuinely my favourite. I talk about him a few times with the young people, and so we're going to see that Barnabas, whenever people talk about him, Barnabas, we're going to talk about encouragement. But we're going to see that encouragement is more than just words. It is words, but it's more than words. And that's good, because our whole series on Acts is called More Than Words Anyway. And so Barnabas, we're going to see, was a guy who encouraged the church, and of course he would have said a lot of encouraging things. And we need to know what it is in our church to be people who encourage well, who speak good things. Like, that is essential. We just have to do that. But encouragement, as we're going to hopefully unpack, is, is more than just words as well. It's not just sending a nice message, although it absolutely is part of what we're going to do. And it's so kind of unnatural, I think, sometimes, particularly in our modern culture. It's kind of, we're quite individual these days. And so encouragement kind of it breaks down some barriers and we kind of get come, kind of lost in our own little worlds. And encouragement, dare I say, within the UK is not something that we are as good at. Like, I have been around Americans a bit more now, and they are a bit more 
they're a bit more emotionally open. That's the way I should say, isn't it? Like, we are a bit more reserved, we are a bit more, but we're not necessarily great at celebrating other people and cheering other people on. And actually, we want to be some people who are better at that. We want to be a church that know what it is to celebrate that. And we're going to see that Barnabas was a guy that, that did that. And a whole system can kind of be built about where do I fit? Like, where's my ranking? Am I high up? Am I low up? Am I kind of, am I better than you? Am I worse than you? And I teach in the university and we get feedback and I buy into that system. I'm like, man, I hope my feedback's high. I don't want to be one of the worst ones. I know I don't have to be one of the best. But actually, I do really want to be one of the best. And it's amazing how quickly we kind of think, right, as long as I'm not at the bottom, we can kind of rank ourselves. And Jesus, when he walked this earth, never bought into that system. Like, the religious people probably didn't know where to put him. They were like, well, is it, he's kind of following the rules, but he's a bit rogue, and is he below us? Because I'm a religious leader, and I want this guy to be under me. And they, Jesus would, just wouldn't fit. And so they really resented that and really reacted to that. And the early church were people who didn't seem to care about their position in life. They seemed to be people who shared everything, who lived humbly, who knew what it was to walk together and not care about, well, what's my title in the church? What's my position in this church? And, and we're going to see Barnabas was, was one of this. It was, um, he gets his name changed. His name's not originally Barnabas. His name is Joseph. Uh, but he gets his name changed. And so some of the coolest Bible characters have nicknames. James and John were the Sons of Thunder. Oh, that is a pretty, I mean, that, they are up there. They are, that is a strong set of nicknames. John changed that a little bit, and he became, I was the disciple that Jesus loved. I think maybe Sons of Thunder was a bit too hard, and he was like, no, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Peter became the Rock, uh, which is obviously quite a cool nickname, although Dwayne Johnson became the Rock, and he's trying to be serious again. He's gone back to being Dwayne, Ron, Dwayne Johnson. Never doing it. I'm calling him The Rock until I die. And we all know that if Dwayne Johnson's in a movie, it's a bad movie. I think that's acceptable. There's time in our lives for bad movies. I go to movies with Isaac, and sometimes I don't want a story. I want to eat a ton of popcorn with chocolate in. I want explosions to happen. That's all I want. Don't tell me a story. Just let explosions happen, and The, the Rock is good for that. If you want depth, not your man. Um, but, but Barnabas was called Joseph, and they rename him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, because it was just so in him that they changed his whole name, because that's who he was. It wasn't just something nice that he did. They were like, man, this guy just is encouragement. He just embodies it. And that's the kind of thing that I want us to be known, that Life Church is a church that does whatever, that we would be known as a church that loves our community, that loves our town, that loves our nation. That people go, oh, Life Church, oh, yeah, they're the ones that do this. Or I met someone from Life Church, and they... They just kind of made me feel that like I was valued and I was worth something. And we want people to kind of see that God moving through us and be known for a different thing rather than just, that's a church that me in this school or in that community center or, or whatever it is. And yeah, so we can be people who are better at encouragement. Somebody yesterday encouraged me greatly. I was explaining that I'd once applied for The Apprentice and I got to the interview stage and I couldn't go because it clashed with a, a, a men's weekend that I go away on. And I was saying it was probably a good thing because it might have ruined my entire career. I mean, career. Who cares? Well, it might have ruined it. I, you know, I could have. Who knows where they're going to show you on TV. And this person said, yeah, I don't think you'll come across well on TV. I said, oh, I don't know what to put. I was like, oh, well, you think, you think a lot of me. And I was like, my mate had married her. And I was like, oh, man, she is a problem. And so, uh, but it is what it is. And so uh, once I pulled a rock a rock wall down on her leg, quite accidentally, but now quite happy it happened. And so, um, just so, never mind. Anyway, so we're going to get into Barnabas, read the Bible quick. And so, yes, yeah, so Barnabas, the first thing we see of him is in Acts 4. We're not going to read Acts 4 bit. Uh, we're going to read Acts 11 for those of you who want to turn to it. It will be on the screen. We're going to read Acts 11. But we see Barnabas in Acts 4, and all we see is it says, oh, there was a guy called Barnabas, and he sold a field, and he put the money at the... Uh, apostles feet so that's the first thing and you want to be in church with a guy like that right a guy who's going to sell his property and give it to the church those people are welcome like they are very welcome in life church i mean we'll give half of it away but still like you know that's the kind of people you want in your church the people who are wholehearted and we're going to jump in to kind of the next time that he's seen which is acts 11 verses 19 to 13 it will come up hopefully on the screen my clicker I might not be working, Rob. I might be out of batteries. You might be, I might be trusting you with it, but you're, you're good. You've got this. So, Acts 11, verse 19 to 30 says, Now those that had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed travelled as far as Phoenicia 
Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and then they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all, our, all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. Um, this happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. They did this by sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. And so that's where we kind of see Barnabas. Like there's a new church kicking off and Jerusalem need to kind of support it and they want to kind of get behind it. So they send someone and they send Barnabas and that shows that this guy was important. You're not just sending, oh, who can we just get rid of? Like they were like, right, we need somebody to go and make sure this is going to go well. So they send Barnabas. And Barnabas straight away is a guy who knows what it is to sell his property and give it to the church. And he knows what it is to leave Jerusalem, the center of where it's all happening. Okay, and I'll go. I'll go to this place that I don't know and I'll lead this church. And he, so he gets there uh, and then all it says, he doesn't have a kind of crazy message in terms of like, it just says, when he arrived and saw what God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Just a simple message, just saying, hey, God's, you know, God's good and you're doing well, let's just stay close to him. And he stays there and he does that. He's not the star of the show as we're going to come in and see. This is just a guy who's pointing people to God and saying, hey, this Jesus who rose from the dead and who came alive, he can transform our lives and he can transform our church. And it tells us that he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And he's not like a, just a church hopper. He's not just somebody who goes on all these missions. When he goes somewhere, he invests and he puts his time into things. And he's so wholehearted in what he does. And so, you know, he's a man who knows what it is to encourage people and go where the need is, whether that's his time, whether that's his money. He knows what it is to be like, right, if God's called me to do it, I am in. Like, and so, like, that is what he wants to say. Like, that's what he wants to live his life to be. And, and as we kind of, some of us are responsible for the young people here, and we want to show them lives that know what it is to kind of be all in and say, you know what, if that costs me money or if it costs me time, I want to say there is a different way. I want these young people to grow up and know that actually life is not about just getting an education so that you can get a good job, so that you can earn some good money, so that you can get a good house, so that you can leave a good inheritance, so that the people behind you are a bit more comfortable. None of that is a problem, but that is not the only way to life, and it just seems so different to what we see in these, these passages here. It just seems so different to the church to say, you know what, if some of those things come, fine, but they are not the goal. The goal is not that how much can we collect by the end of life it's not monopoly, so at the end, we have this destroyed all the people around us and we have got more than you. It is not a competitive Della family game of monopoly, which always ends in me winning and everybody in the family hating me. I'm assuming I'm not in the will anymore, but that's okay, because I've won a lot. And so it's fine, you know, I don't mind for not having an inheritance uh, as long as they land on me and pay up. But like, Barnabas is a guy that lives differently. And we're going to see that, like, that is it. It's a different way to live. And, and Jesus called us to live a different way. This guy who just gets called to do something and goes and does it. This guy, when there's a need, uh, it just gives out. It says here, the church heard of a need that was coming, and they just gave what they were able to. And I'm sure that is because they were led by a guy called Barnabas, who his first thing is to say, hey, I've got some property, and I'm just going to give it, and I'm going to sell it. And so as he leaves, people catch what it is and say, right, yeah, we're going to do this as well. And we want to be a church that, that kind of model that. We are starting to take offerings. I'm going to let you behind the curtains of leadership discussions now. We're going to start to take offerings once a month. I don't want to take offerings. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that from the front. Lucas isn't here. Tonight, I might not say that. And so, um, <laughs> but we don't want to, like, we've never taken an offering here. We've got a box at the back, and that's it. Most people give through the bank. I understand that. But we don't want to, I don't want to take an offering personally because I don't like 
the guilt aspect of putting something in front of your face and people going, oh, I wasn't going to give, but it looks weird now, doesn't it? I'll get something out of my wallet, I'll put something in. You know what, we'll make more money that way. But that is a bad way to make more money. Like, I don't want to guilt people in. But then Lucas, to be fair to him, had a good argument. He said, I want my kids to see that I give to church. I don't, just because it's going through the bank, I don't want them to be like, oh, well, we just, it just happens, right? Like, we want our young people and our children, we want them to know that the money that we have as we earn money, that is God's money. That is not for us. That's not just mine. And actually, it's important to show that part of being a Christian is living sacrificially. And actually, people need to see. We don't know how we're going to do that for those of you who give through the bank. And like, we certainly don't want just more money out of guilt. That is not the plan. But we want people to see that actually part of our lives is that the money that we earn is God's. And we give it to him and we trust him with it. He's going to do more with it than we can do ourselves. And so we are going to uh, do that and we are going to kind of just show that because we want to be showing people life is not about our own kind of comfort and safety. And that's what Barnabas uh, helps model. Second thing that we see is, um, yeah, so if we, if we flip on, that was just there. Was, yeah, Barnabas was not self-seeking. Now this takes us to my little quiz that I've got. So we have some Americans in the room. Oh, and they're, they are going to be asked a question right now. I thought they would all sit together, but it's got awkward. And uh, they're sitting separately, but that's all right. And so we had a poll in like 2005 years ago where there was a big national survey of the 10 greatest British people of all time. We're going to see if they can name any of them. No pressure, my lovely wife. <laughs> she, let's see if you can name any. Can you give me any name, Americans? Any name that you think might be in our top 10 greatest people of all time? Churchill. Is Churchill, is Churchill there, Rob? He's first on the list. Churchill was number one. Churchill was number one. Of course he was number one. He won any other names. Well, I'm not going to get you to do all ten. Shakespeare was in there. Yeah, Shakespeare's in there. Number five. Number five. Shakespeare was in there. Any more? I'm no more. Two's all right. Who do you think is there, Dave? David Beckham it would be on my greatest <laughs> list. Unfortunately, he's not there. Oh. I mean, there's some rogues on this list. We'll see it in a second. Right, English people, come on. Brunel was there. Queen Elizabeth? Yeah. Which one? Both. No, Queen Elizabeth I was in there. Not the second one, not the current queen. It's a broken list. Prince, Prince Philip is not on there. <laughs> oh, we're going to get bad. Brunel, who built loads of stuff's on there. Queen Elizabeth I, who was a queen. She's on there. Like, no, Victoria's not on there. She was not on there. She was high, but not in the top 10. Yeah. Mr. Bean was not on there. <laughs> Darwin was there. Darwin was there. Wilberforce. Wilberforce was not there. It's a disgrace. Wilberforce, he only stopped slavery. You'll see that I've got an issue with a couple of people on this list. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> so any more for any more? We'll go for the list. Isaac Newton was there. Tim Henman was... Tiger Tim did not make the list with his semi-final defeats. There is no justice. Hmm? Dickens was not there. Rob put us out of our misery. We'll see. Um, Princess Diana was there. Controversially, not on mine. Uh, but um, John Lennon was there, fair enough. Oliver Cromwell was there, uh, which is a rogue shout, but we've got a statue for him in Warrington. He stayed here once, apparently, so well done him. Um, but the point is um, that I just wanted to test the Americans. Now, the point is that, like, we know what it is to kind of rank things. We know what it is to rank people. All those people on the list, mainly, are there because they've achieved and done something. Obviously, Churchill's for what he represented in the war. And, and what he did was great. None of us are taking any of those achievements down. But do you know what? The kingdom of God is not about oh, who's done the most stuff. You have got the highest position. As we'll see, Barnabas, in, in this thing, if we flip ahead to verse 25 and 26, like they had sent Barnabas to this new church. This is Barnabas' time to be number one. He's not in the 12 disciples. This is his moment where he can be, I can lead a church. And it tells us what he does is in verse 25 and 26, he says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him, and then Barnabas and Saul taught the church together. He doesn't go, go, do you know, this is my time to shine. This is, I am the big man, I can run the show. He says, you know what, I need another person, I need help. And he goes to uh, find this guy Saul. And we're going to talk about his story in a, another week. And he goes and finds this guy, and I got a map out, and I got the scale, and I use my fingers, very, very accurate. And it's about 100 to 150 kilometers, depending on how much my fingers changed when I did this to this. 
So uh, it's about 100, 150 kilometers, which in those days, it's quite far. I, to, to get that, you know, he's not just, he's not hopping in a car, he's not on a plane. He's got to find him. He's not saying, right, Paul, where are you going to be? So where are you going to be in a couple of days? He's got to actually go there and then just look for the man. And he's doing that because he knows, you know what? God is saying, you're not a one-man band. You're not doing this on your own. It's not about your position. It's not about your pride. It's about what God's calling us to do. And we've heard a lot, and we're going to hear again today, that God's not saying to us, go and do it yourself. Like Craig shared it. Um, Pete shared it. We heard about it with Eric and Caroline. We're talking about the Holy Spirit saying, right, like, this is what I want to do in my church. And it's not about how good we can do and whether we're high up and top or anything like that. We need to be people who know what it is to not particularly worry about what other people think of ourselves. Like, am I good? Am I bad? Where do I fit in the church? Am I important to the church? Like Barnabas seems so secure in that. And imagine being so secure that you can love people and you can prefer other people without worrying about what people think of you. And like, you know, and that sounds like the way we should live. And it feels pretty impossible because I could tell you every negative piece of feedback I've had from teaching and from preaching, I could reel them off right now because it's easy to say we need to not care about what people think. But man, it is hard to do because we kind of go, no, we know all the things that people say to us. We know what it is, but we need to be help, asking God to help us to be so secure in that place that we could live kind of relatively unknown lives that people may never know our names and we get there and God says to us, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. And nobody might know we've ever kind of existed apart from the small people around us. If that's what God's told us to do, and that's what he's told us to do. And we've kind of got to be okay with that and trust that God has a better plan than just our own fame because that is not what we see and that's not what we see in the gospel. And yeah, like we need to be more like this guy, Dave. Um, I wasn't going to say his name. I've said it now. And my friend Dave, uh, who had a job interview in Oxford and he was nervous. And so he went to a bathroom in Starbucks and did some stuff which blocked a toilet quite, quite badly Flushed it a few times, and you know in Starbucks you've got one cubicle, so everybody's waiting at this point, and he's, he can hear people trying the handle, and he's like, this is blocked. And he's like, there's a queue outside, what do I do? He just puts his head down and walks past, doesn't tell anybody, just walks out of there. And I was like, oh man, I mean, fair enough, I suppose, you don't want to announce it. But now he's gone too far, because he goes to his in-laws and blocks the toilet, and he just shuts the door and leaves. And I'm like, the man don't care. Like, the man has just gone too far now. And so we need to be a little bit more like Dave, not in a disgraceful manner, but we need to know what it is to kind of go, I don't, it doesn't really matter if that person thinks you're popular. You know, and we've heard that with, with some of the stories today that people were like, do you know what, this might be awkward if I pray for this person. It might be awkward if I have this conversation with that person. We need to not be so afraid of awkwardness and stepping into those worlds that we kind of say, oh, actually, this could be quite difficult. And Barnabas seems to be not bothered about whether he's the top dog uh, or not. And the final thing that we'll see in here is that he stood up for others. You know, he stood up uh, for others, and this is his biggest thing, and we're going to see this as a few different verses uh, that we're going to talk about. And, you know, we're not good at awkwardness, as we know in the UK. Weddings, we're going to talk about weddings for a second. So weddings are amazing. We all love weddings. I went to a wedding in Spain, and Sp Spanish people are very exuberant. And what they have to do is they, in the reception, they all lead, each table lead the whole crowd in song. I thought this was a joke. And I, they were like, yeah, so can you lead the song from your table? What? Lead a song? Well, you're all Spanish, so that doesn't help me. I was like, what do you mean lead a song? I was like, this is a prank. I'm not leading a song. Like, this is just a wind-up. They're going to get, I'm going to start singing, and everyone's going to be like, what's the English guy doing singing for? And so as I sat there, every random Spanish table started singing one by one, and then another table would start another song. I was like, oh, either they've committed to the prank, uh, or, or this is real, and it's coming to me, and I'm like, I have to sing. I'm very English. I'm like, I'm like I don't know much Spanish. And certainly no Spanish songs. <laughs> and so they're like, right, it's your time to sing. I was like, okay. So I was like, champion. And they were like, why is he singing that? I was like, I don't know, but join in. <laughs> and, and, so, and I was like, and you might think that's the most awkward thing that's happened to me at a wedding. But no, I got married in America. And America have this wonderful tradition where the bride and groom have a first dance. Normal. No problem with that. That's acceptable. The bride then dances with the father of bride. Lovely moment. Everyone watches. Uh, and so the bride and her father, they dance. The whole crowd watches. And then the son, uh, the, the, the groom dances with his mother. 
Oh, but I'm English, so I'm not going to do that. I say to my mum, we don't have to do this. They've released us. I don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. They've said we don't have to do it. But is it normal? Well, yeah, it is normal, but we won't do it. No, I want to. If this is their normal thing, we're going to do it. But I don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. Why are we doing it? Well, this is the done thing. Okay, we're going to have the worst four minutes of our entire lives. And so, and so my best man stands up in the wedding and goes, Thank you, America. Just thank you for this moment that you've brought to my life. Could not have been happier. It was worth him flying to America just to see me on the spot like that. Horrible scenes. And so anyway, so Barnabas, um, it was lovely. We danced. It was wonderful. Um, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's on video. Great. My mum's here now. I still love my mum. We'll get there. Uh, she's going to... I'll redeem it at the end. And so Barnabas in Acts 15, Barnabas gets in a proper awkward conversation. Like, the council at Jerusalem are saying, right, these people who are not Jewish, who are becoming Christians, do they need to be circumcised or not? That is, now, if you are a man who has become a Christian and you are not Jewish, you are hoping that conversation goes one way. Like, do we need to be circumcised or not? No, will be my answer, please. So, they need to go to send someone to the council to sort this mess out. Who do they send? They send Barnabas. Of course they send Barnabas. And Barnabas goes in there, comes back, they decide, you know what, the non-Jewish guys, you don't need to be circumcised when you decide to follow Jesus, it's fine. Barnabas comes back with that news, and it says, the people were glad at the decision. Yeah, you're not kidding. <laughs> you're not kidding. Because Barnabas is a hero. Imagine him walking back with that news, you don't need to be circumcised. Oh, Barnabas, I owe you my life. Like, it's just going to be incredible. So imagine how awkward that weird conversation is, but he's saying, it's not just about that, it's about kind of, right, we've got these people who are not Jewish, how do we do it? And that would have been difficult. And Barnabas is there, right in the middle of that church tension, dealing with that awkwardness and so on. And then at the end of, so Barnabas and Paul, they go on missions, they go preaching the gospel wherever, they go all over the place. And then, after a while, they split. And the reason they split is because Barnabas wants to take Mark with him. And, but Mark has bailed on him previously. And Paul's like, you know what, he's bailed on us previously. I don't really think we should take him. And they go their separate ways. Barnabas goes with Mark. Paul goes with Silas somewhere else. And the, you really don't hear about Barnabas for the rest of the story. But then in Colossians, you have this one verse. And in Colossians 4, which is years after this. So after they've split, okay, so they've, years later after they split, and Paul and felt let down by Mark previously, Paul's then saying, look, my fellow prisoner sends you his greeting, as does Mark the cousin of Barnabas. And so Mark, this guy who, who'd let him down previously, he's back in the fold. Why? Because Barnabas stood with him and believed in him. When it all kind of, when they all split and Paul went off with somebody else, Barnabas said, no, Mark, we're still going to take him. We're still going to do stuff with him. And Mark gets restored in the church, even though he might have run away. And his relationship with Paul seems to be restored because one man stood for him. And that wasn't Paul. That was Barnabas, this guy we hear about for nothing. And I don't want you to kind of think that Barnabas was was perfect, because in no way was this guy perfect. There's a, a part where he does kind of get afraid of people. And when the Jewish people turn up and he's hanging out with the non-Jewish people, but when the big people from the church come, he doesn't eat with them anymore and he goes and eats with the church people. So he's not a, he's not a flawless man. Barnabas is not the model to follow. He's not perfect. And this isn't like a self-help, let's just be more encouraging and let's do it. But Barnabas was a guy that most scholars have him as one of the kind of 70 in Luke 10, where kind of Jesus says to 70 people, hey, I'm going to send you on mission. Most scholars have him as that. So he would have been a guy who was around Jesus, who was there, who would have known what the Jesus, certainly was in the early church, would have known the, the kind of main teachings of Jesus. And he got what it was to kind of be abnormal. And I want you to kind of, kind of think about three people particularly. Like Barnabas knew what it was to, wherever he was, to be invested. And it is hard to invest in so many people in your life. But I want you to just think, mate, like this year, and by this year, I mean maybe this academic year, because we're near the end, just think, right, is, is there three people in my life that I can really be this guy for, like really live like this way, that I can put them first, that I can pay any kind of cost that they need, that I can stand there for them in tough times? And you just think, is there three people that I can do that with this year? And, and just kind of commit to it in your own head and just think, right, these three, this year, if they need something, I'm driving to them. If they need... These, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to, if I get a word, I'm going to send them a message saying, hey, I think this is what God's saying about you. I'm just going to have them around. I'm going to ask how they're doing. You know, is there three people? We could do it with more people. That's fine. But like, let's be honest about the capacity we have and say, 
Imagine if three people felt that kind of love and three people just went, man, you just seem to put me first. You seem to really selflessly care about me. And if you, that seems to be the kind of way that Barnabas lived. And, and it's difficult. And the final point, as I kind of challenge us with that, hopefully, is that we can't do it, which sounds quite depressing. And I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. You can't do this. But then, like, Craig prayed and he said, it's not about what we can do. We don't want to strive at it in our strength. And Pete said it. And we talked about it. It's not about what we can do. Because actually, I, I can't live this kind of brilliantly selfless life and just not care about what other people think. We can't do that on our own because we're not meant to do it on our own. We're not meant to run off and say, oh, yeah, we believe in God. Great. Nice one, Jesus. Leave it with me. I've got this. We're meant to have this relationship with God and we say, God, I can't do this. But I want to live this way. I want to be different. I can't model to our young people a different life without God actually doing it for me because otherwise I'm just going to try hard and I'm going to fail. What I need is to say, God, will you just change me from the inside out? Will you come alive in me and will you transform things? And it's that that kind of the, the world needs. And the final kind of story, the final the kind of probably Barnabas' best moment, if I can say best, is one I've deliberately kind of missed out so far. And it's this kind of part where in Act 9, verses 26 to 28, and this is before Barnabas and Paul go on all these kind of crazy missions. Those of you who might know the story, that Paul was this guy, Saul, who was trying to imprison the church and go after them. And then he goes up to the council in Jerusalem, and they are nervous. They're thinking, like, I do not trust this guy. He's been trying to imprison us, and now he becomes a, becomes a Christian, and then he's like, oh, yeah, I've been following Jesus. I want to be one of you. And they do not trust that. Of course they don't, because he's the guy who's been trying to arrest them. Why would they trust that? And in Acts 9, 26 to 28, it says, when Paul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. They were afraid of him, not believing he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him, and brought him to the apostles. And he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. He stands in between Paul and the apostles, and he puts his own reputation on the line, he puts his own standing on the line, and says, no, I'm going to stand for this guy, because what God's done in this guy is real. And he could have been kicked out, they could have said, no, Barnabas, if you're with, it, with this guy, we don't want anything to do with you. Barnabas knew what it was to say, do you know what, none of this matters if I'm not doing what God's called me to do. None of it counts. And so he knew what it was to stand there and put that out there. Can you just imagine being loved? If you were Paul, imagine a guy loving you so much that he puts everything on the line for you. And you'd be like, so why? Like, why would you do that for me? And like Barnabas, as we said, was a guy who knew, he proper knew Jesus, and knew what Jesus had done. And you might think, no one's ever loved me like that. No one cares enough about me like that. And many of you will know I've I've kind of been quite harsh towards my own mother in that wedding story, but it's going to come good now. Like many of you will know that years ago when I was 24, 23, 24, like the time when I was swimming in debt, stood at a cash point, I had nothing. And I just remember being stood there, tears in my eyes with my mum next to me. And I was like, man, all of this kind of thing that I built about this good job, I am a mess. And I was like, and I was so ashamed of how I'd failed in life and how I'd just done it all. And my parents, they just took the, some of that debt on themselves. They couldn't really afford that. They just took it on, gave me a window. And I was like, man, I felt more loved in that moment than in all the achievements that I'd done and in all the, hey, look, aren't I doing well? The moment where I was like, oh, man, I'm a mess. But they stood there for no reason other than loving me. At that point, I was like, man, I feel loved. And you might think, oh, but yeah, I've never had that, anyone do that for me. Do you know what? As a church, we stand there because that is what Jesus has done. That as we're a mess, as our lives are just a shambles, we have a God who cares enough to stand there and go, hey, I died for this kind of stuff. If you would give me all that pain and all that nonsense, I died that you could be born again, that you could have a fresh start, that you could restart, and that I could come alive in you and you could be different. You know, and through that, and when we accept that, when we live differently, that is how we live the kind of life that we see here, this selfless life that loves people, that changes things, not by what we do ourselves. And if you don't know that, that love, if you've never met Jesus, I promise you he cares. I promise you he cares about the stuff that, that holds you down, that you're ashamed of, and he can change that, and he can just give you a whole new thing and a whole new life. And so I'm going to pray, and we're going to respond to that. I know kind of time is on, but, you know, you got me up later than normal, so <laughs> that's on you, Craig. And so, like, but we want to respond, like, some of, we just know, if we want to live these lives, we know we can't do it. 
So we're just going to call for some response for people who, who want to just have more of the Holy Spirit. And I know there's some people who've got other needs about kind of healing and stuff. And so I'm going to hand to Craig. We're probably going to, I imagine, soft land it and release yeah, people we'll and so yeah. on. So, um, yeah, Craig is going to lead us in this. Kind of okay. Next yeah, time, time is of the essence. But however, um, you know, we talked about living out of that place of, of Holy Spirit. And, you know, it's so easy just to say, right, that's the end of the service. Those who want prayer, come up to the front. Because it's easy to do that, but what it does, so I can't get my head around Ruth cuddling a dog, but anyway, it's, um, what I want to do, very quickly, we've got, we've got a few minutes, kids team will be all right. If you're here this morning, and we, we don't need to know why, but if you're just in need of something, life's tough, you've got challenges, something's not quite right, then like, I'm going to be un-British about this, okay? I just want you to stand. No one's going to think anything less of you. No one's going to think anything like, you know, oh, man, I didn't know that person was going through tough times. It's not about that. Okay, and then what I'd like us to do as a congregation, and it, it'll mean you're shifting, is I want you to get, in fact, what we'll do, if you guys want to go to the back of the room, us guys will come to the back and we'll get around you and pray for you. Is that all right? That's probably because then that space works. Yeah, if you've got kids and you need to go and get them, go and get them. But for the rest of us, this is your opportunity, okay, to stand like Saul stood, um, Barnabas stood up for Saul. He stood with him, put him forward. This is our chance to stand with our family and to pray for them. And you don't need to know why, just stand with them, let them pray. It's, it's a conversation between them and God. But by praying with them and being with them and praying Holy Spirit over them, that's what we're here to do. Yeah, so don't just run and get your coffees. Guys, if you want to just go and stand at the back, that would be amazing. And guys, just to encourage you, go and stand with these folk. Yeah, it's, an, it's a privilege and a pleasure to do this, to stand with our family in need. And uh, don't ask them why they need prayer. And they might want to tell you, but don't ask them. Just pray for Holy Spirit to rest over them, to be with them. That would be amazing.